Let's talk about building a strong foundation. There's no bigger influence on my life than my mother. My mother, see, my mother was a little bit different than most mothers. Most mothers, you know, they, they, their child can't do any wrong. You know, oh, my, you should see my son. He's the most handsome. He's going to be the, the best in the world. The, my daughter, she's gorgeous. Princess. No, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I, was, a, I was a cute, cute baby. That's, that's not, you're not going to see me anymore. You know, the baby's faces that look like this. But my mom, she really held me to a level of accountability to where I really understood what was going on when I was wrong, right? She helped me to that level of accountability and she disciplined me in a way to which I understood what was going on and how to move forward and how to fix it. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 13, and 14, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish a child with a ride, they will not die. Punish them with a ride and you will save them from death. And I can tell you right now, with completely, without a doubt, a shadow of a doubt that my mom's discipline kept me alive to see 30 years old today. You see, I, I, I've, I've been to 27 funerals of people that I knew and grew up with in my 30 year lifespan, right? And most of those have, have came to me in probably like the, the past 13, 14 years, which is a crazy, crazy statistic when you talk about it. But like, I, I remember there was times in, in, in school Right, you know, you you're running with the boys and you're having fun, and you know, you, you, it, it, it would get in trouble, right? We all got called. We all go to the principal's office, and I remember like it was yesterday. The principal said, "You're gonna sign these referrals. You guys know y'all was in the wrong. You're gonna sign these referrals. You're gonna take these three swats, and you're gonna go back to class." And I'm like, "Okay, cool. And I'm getting ready to sign." And I said, my boy said, "I'm not signing nothing, right? And you can't give me swats." I'm looking at him like, man, what's going on? He said, nah, I'm not take, I'm not signing nothing. I'm getting no swats. Call my mom and, and, and we'll talk about it. I'm like, whoa, bro. Nah, nah, don't call my mom. Like, I'm, let me take, where you want me to sign right here? Let, let me go and take my swats. Let me take these three because let me tell you, my mom, my mom is not that type of person. I don't know how your house, I don't know where you come from, but in my house, if you call my mom and she in the middle of a story, we got a problem. You, I'm talking about we got a serious, serious problem, right? And and I'm not going to get three swats when she gets here. I can tell you right now. My mom's the type of mom, she's going to come in and she's, she's, she's not going to even ask you what I've done. None of that. I'm always in. If I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong. My mom was going to ask you, Mr. Principal, can I borrow your office and your power? And I'm going to shut the blinds because I want you to see what's going to happen next. See, I had one of those moms that was willing to hold me accountable. If I stole something, you came and knocked on my door, my mom wouldn't say, oh, it wasn't my kid. My mom had a nickname for me that, I mean, it wrong all the way through the house. If, if I ever heard her say it in, a, in, a, in the right tone, or the wrong tone in my, in my case, I knew it was a problem. See, every, you, see you, you guys probably know me as Corn or, or Shaq. My mom called me the last part of my first name, Nilius. <laughs> And I can always know if I if I ever heard it ring through the house, millions. That was a problem. Somebody had asked for something and, and, it, and it wasn't going to be good. So when she came to when she came to that principal office for the first time, and I learned my lesson, she closed the door and, and I and I and I was in there for about probably five or six minutes, and it felt like a lifetime. So I knew for sure that I was signing my referral and I was going to the class. Get my three licks. I will let you up, y'all boys later. We'll, we'll get up. But I don't live that type of life. I don't have that type of mom. I don't know what y'all are going through, but my mom was going to hold me accountable for everything I did. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about adversity, you know, because I went through some adversities, you know, pretty early in life, right? Uh, first thing of adversity I had to go through is I was a fatherless child, right? My mom had me when she was 16 years old. I didn't have a father. So I, I had some things that I had to come up against and I had to deal with as a, as a young child. So I, I knew what type of father I would be when I was 10 years old. Because I, I found myself asking myself, you know, what, what would my life be like if I had a father in my life? Would my mom's boyfriend be able to spank me? Would he be able to take my stuff away? Would he be able to tell me I couldn't go outside and play with my kid or with my friends, right? What would my life be like if I had somebody to teach me how to throw a ball, teach me how to dribble? See, I knew what type of father I was going to be like to my kids when I had kids one day when I was 10 years old, when I found myself asking myself those questions. 
those questions I knew that my sons, my daughters would never have to ask themselves that type of question. I knew that I, they would never feel that type of pain as a kid. So I went through that type of adversity, right? So I'm, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Cause I, man, my first real adversity physically came when I was 12 years old. And I've never ever spoken about this in public before. You know, transparency, important. And I didn't really get the, the importance of transparency until about a year ago. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm still growing, he's a 30 year old man. So don't feel like you're alone, we are all growing, right? So when I was 12 years old, my sister came home and she said, you, you can't, she heard me, my, my, my little brother talking, and I was talking about doing 15 backflips in a row on a trampoline, you got a trampoline in the backyard, right? And so, my sister heard us, oh, she overheard us, she said, you can't do 15 backflips in a row. I'm like, I, I've already done it, what are you talking about? I tell you yesterday, yesterday was a Sunday, just so you know, right? And at the time, I didn't understand the importance of, you know, the human body and how much it really could take. <laughs> Sunday, Middle sports, you know, nothing. Not, this day, this day was Monday. Also, happened to be my grandmother's birthday. That's all I remember. Like yesterday, my mom had left to go to Berkshire's to buy my grandmother a birthday cake so we can go surprise her on her birthday. She worked at ATMC Hospital, and so we went to go. So she went to go pick up the birthday cake. And meanwhile, at the at the house, my sister's telling me that I can't do something that I know I can do that I've already done. Mind you, I just got out of school, I just got out of football practice, sprints, conditioning, all this good stuff. But I'm not, that's not important to me. The important thing is she said I can't do something that I, I know to be that I can do. So I go out there and I said, I approve, let's go back, let's go outside. And I get on the trampoline and I start flipping. 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 Everything's going great. <laughs> I get to about 10, 11, I'm starting to get pretty dizzy. But I keep flipping because I can't let her be right. She said I couldn't do it, and I can, and I know it. So I keep flipping. Well, I'm 14. I pass out in midair. I come down like a rag doll, no control of my body, not even conscious at all in midair. I come down, my knee bounces off, my feet bounce off the trampoline, my knee goes in my mouth, knocks all the top six of my teeth loose, hanging. I'm out. I come to my brother and sister screaming, crying. Sorry if it's too bold, bold for some of you guys, but that it, my, my brother and sister are screaming, crying, and I don't know what's going on. I wake up and I'm in a puddle of my own blood. And I'm looking, looking around and I'm like, I'm really not really knowing what's going on. So I get out, I stumble out the truck lane, and I walk in the house. And I'm not crying or anything. I walk in the house and I and I look in the mirror and I open my mouth and I just start bawling. <laughs> and my, my little brother, just, what? Why are you crying now? You wasn't crying while ago. And I said, I'm ugly. <laughs> right? So, I mean, it, it wasn't funny then, right? It was, it was kind of hilarious now, but like, it wasn't funny then. But so I went to the hospital and instead of surprising my, my grandmother with a surprise birthday cake, we surprised her with her grandson with his teeth hanging from his mouth. Right? And so it's a life changing experience for everybody. <laughs> it was a birthday I remember from my grandmother for sure. And so uh, the way that the process happened is that, you know, they had to give me shots in my gums, needles, shots in my gums, shots in my lips. And it took about nine people to hold me down, this 12 year old kid, <laughs> to hold me down and, and to get this procedure done. And then they went on to, to push my teeth back in my mouth, which is equally excruciating, most pain I've ever been in my life. Right, and so the whole process was really shaping me to be somebody else later. Right, I couldn't see that now. There's no way I could have, but I got stitches and I got you know braces the next morning to hold my teeth in place with hopes of saving what were my permanent teeth. Right, so God blessed me to be able to my my roots to you know grow back and take to all except for this one tooth you see right here. So now I wear a retainer in my mouth, but that actually didn't happen until a couple years ago. I didn't actually lose the tooth for a couple years. I held on to it long as I, as long as I possibly could. I wore braces to hold my teeth in place <laughs> all the way into my senior year in high school. The braces was not fixing my teeth. I was self-conscious. It was something that I dealt with for a very long time, right? And everybody knew those braces weren't fixing my teeth, but it was a comfort level for me, right? It was something that I was continuously dealing with. 
And I grew up in a rough neighborhood. I told you, you know, it, it was a big deal. Like, you know, we, we, we talked about each other. We went, at, we went at it. That was just a way of life, right? And so I always knew what was going to come when I got into one of these little, you know, powwows and going back and forth. I didn't even say something for them, <laughs> right? Try to beat them to the punch, right? Because I knew the punch line was coming, something about my teeth. And, and I, that was something that I constantly had to deal with, that adversity constantly shaped who I was going, I was becoming. You know, now backing up to that day, there was a few things that I learned about myself on that day when I was 12 years old. One thing I learned is that I don't like when people tell me I can't do something. <laughs> I, I can't stand it with a passion. I'm still that way to this very day. I don't like, sometimes I'll tell you that I'm gonna do something significant just so you can not believe in me. So just so you, I can find two or three people to tell me that I can't do it so I know I'll get it done, right? That's the first thing I learned about myself. Second thing I learned about myself is that I was willing to push myself further than anybody else was willing to go physically and mentally. If I wanted to go there, there was no one who could stop me from going there. And that has helped me along with my business, my relationships, my sports career. Me finding that out about, out about myself when I was 12, it changed the trajectory of my life. 